Welcome back to Yu-Gi-Oh! History with Joe Gerlando. In today's video, we are returning to September 2011, often referred to as Tengu Plant Format, and taking a look at what was arguably the most popular deck in YCS Toronto, Agents. Now, Agents was a popular deck, one, because it was just a fantastic deck. From a modern deck building perspective, it checks off all of the boxes. It has a great collection of starters in Tour Guide, Venus, and Earth. It has the best collection of hand traps. Yes, Valor and Maxi, which were cards you could have played in the plant deck, but then specific archetype specific hand traps like Herald of Orange Light plus Honest. And then in addition to that, it actually had cards like Tragodia plus Gores, which was basically a staple in any non-trap heavy deck that gave you outs when your opponent took the maxi challenge, which meant tons of starters, tons of defensive hand traps. And then in addition to that, a ton of boss monsters, which using more modern Yu-Gi-Oh terminology, we could definitely consider extenders. I'm talking about Master Hyperion, the archetype specific boss monster, but then also cards like Arctrod Christia, which this deck had fantastic flexibility with, cards like Black Luster Soldier, newly unbanned, cards like Chaos Sorcerer could be used as boss monsters. Plus, in addition to all of those main deck boss monsters, this deck, because it had access to Earth and even Birdman, plus Effect Veiler under some situations, can access all of the extra deck boss monsters like Trishula with ease, giving this deck perfect flexibility using modern terminology. It has starters, extenders, and defensive cards. That's really exactly what you look for in a deck from a modern deck building perspective, although back in 2011 we weren't using those terms to describe this deck. So that's one of the reasons this deck was really popular. From a philosophical standpoint, it was a fantastic deck, even if we use modern views in terms of describing some of the card choices. Plus, for the first couple of weeks of testing leading up to Toronto, people viewed Agents as a tier zero deck, and it was because for a small window of Yu-Gi-Oh's history, Cards like Sangin and Reborn Tengu were actually able to trigger their effects when detached with XYZ monsters. So, for example, Torguide into Sangin wasn't just Leviathan Pass, it was Torguide into Sangin, Leviathan, Detach Sangin, and Search. Under those conditions, you could then search a card like Effect Veiler, allowing you to counteract your opponent's Torguide, but now also giving you a light and a dark. And when players looked at this format, especially early on with those interactions, they were trying to find the deck that would take the most advantage of that. And Agents was a perfect one because Agents had both access to Chaos Sorcerer and Black Luster Soldier naturally, and now had the deck that was already going to be playing these hand traps slash tour guide engines, making it such that a lot of people viewed Agent decks early in September 2011 almost as if they were viewing it at dab or turn level, which was prior to that one of the earlier tier zero decks. As the format progressed and as the rulings changed and were tweaked, which is on an aside one of the best decisions Yu Gi Oh has ever made. They likely would have had to completely change the XYZ mechanic or change the rules of Yu-Gi-Oh! similar to Pendulum Monsters if for all of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s history, Sangin, Reborn Tengu, Goblin Zombie, and those type of cards all triggered their effects off of detaching. Luckily, that decision was made early on. But for those first few weeks of September, plus that YCS in Indianapolis, that is what took place, and those particular events were pretty ridiculous. But players had already invested so much time into Agents, and even with that ruling change, Agents were still a perfectly fine deck. So going into Toronto, even though agents were taken sort of out of that tier zero range and more into just simply a tier one deck, the deck was absolutely still tier one. It did great results at Toronto, the first event of the format, not as well at Columbus, but then it had a little bit of a resurgence at Kansas City. And then as the format progressed and Yu-Gi-Oh went on for a year, the deck would evolve over time. Eventually you'd have versions that were based on Car Trooper and Call of the Haunted, bringing back those monsters, but in addition to that, cards like Thunder King Ryo out of the graveyard with Call of the Haunted, and it became sort of a, a stun control -y deck based on Call of the Haunted. Early on, though, the deck that we're going to take a look at today is going to be based on Barrett Key's version. Now, as is always the case when you look at September 2011, it's important to put exactly what event you're taking a look at. If you're looking at just Toronto, it, that's an important thing to note because Dark Worlds are not yet released. So if you're going to play that format, you do not need to side deck cards like Gemini Imps or Shadow Imprisoning Mirror. They just wouldn't make sense. Shadow Imprisoning Mirror might be okay against Gravekeepers, but it has no flexibility outside of that one very small matchup. If you're going to play Columbus, which was the event that followed, one of the big things you need to take into consideration was, in fact, the release of Dark Worlds. The deck that I'm profiling in just a few moments is going to be a deck that would have been legal at Columbus. Now, Barrett had success at Toronto and then Kansas City. I'll talk about Kansas City in a moment. I'm kind of melding both of those decks together, talking about some of the differences and creating a side deck that I think would have been flexible at Columbus specifically. That's going to be the basis and inspiration for this specific version of the deck. If we take a look at Kansas City, which was outside of the range that we're talking about, the difference would have been the release of Photon Shockwave, which would require you to tweak your deck in some pretty significant ways. 
because that would have come with the release of Wind Up Zen Means, which is a card you definitely need to have outs for in the main deck. And then in addition to that, the release of Rescue Rabbit and thus the release of Dino Rabbit. I have elected to look at just Columbus because when people go back and play Tengu Plant format, that typically is the line of demarcation. We don't really go past that. Most people look at just Columbus, if not just Toronto, which means the decision that most people make is, do we play with Dark World legal or do we not? That's really the point of discussion. I am profiling a deck where Dark World is legal. Virtually nobody goes past that. That event in Kansas City is kind of a unique event because that was at a point where Photon Shockwave was out. So you had access to Rescue Rabbit, you had access to Zen Mains, but the Insector windup card that came out later on in the format before we start to transition into 2012 were not yet out. So Kansas City is sort of a one-off event that's not really representative of the format or any format thereafter at all. It's kind of a unique event in that sense. So most people usually end their look at Tengu Plants with Columbus, which is exactly where we are stopping today. But without further ado, we are going to take a deep dive look at Barrett Key's agent deck, sort of a meld between his decks from both YCS Toronto and a little bit of YCS Kansas City that would have been a deck representative of what you can anticipate running at YCS Columbus. All right, we'll start the deck profile off with one of this deck's biggest appeals, which is the fact that it had a lot of really great starters. That term starter is not a term that we used back in 2011. It was a term that po Pat Hoban popularized years later when talking about deck building, whether a starter, extender, resistance, or defensive cards. That terminology was not used back in the day, but if we go and apply more modern deck building views to this particular deck, we will see that this deck has a ton of really fantastic starters. Cards that in and of themselves are great, obviously, on the first turn, but get the game going in your direction. They start to push your game plan. In modern Yu-Gi-Oh! A starter might be a single card that can make a huge board. Back in 2011, a starter is a card that either can set you up reasonably speaking on the first turn, like Venus, going into double gotcha gotcha, or going into double shine ball plus gotcha gotcha, or a card like Earth that can search the Venus for the follow-up, or a card like Tour Guide, which can either search Sangin, which is in and of itself a follow-up on the following turn, or allow you to go into Leviathan Dragon, which is a 2500 attack monster that your opponent needs to deal with while also fueling darks in the graveyard for some of your chaos monsters. So this deck had nine really fantastic turn one summons that got the ball rolling in your direction. Venus was a card that was out way before the release of Hyperion, but it really got to shine, no pun intended, with the release of Earth. When you combine Earth with Venus, it allows you to have a level two tuner on the field, which is what Earth is in, in addition to just being the Stratos of the deck. But then if you were able to protect that and summon Venus, it allowed you to go into all those shine balls and then have the ability to fluctuate whatever level you need. You'd have you know, anywhere between one to three shine balls on the field, plus a level three non-tuner and a level two tuner, allowing you to go into level four, level six, level eight, level seven. seven. I mean, there's a variety of different levels that you can go into, right? Two, three, plus two is seven. This here is Trishula, which is obviously fantastic at level nine. Gave you a ton of flexibility in terms of what level you wanted to go into, which made the shine ball package really fantastic, considering the fact that Earth was a tuner. Now, granted, this deck doesn't have a lot of defensive cards in it, so you're not always protecting earth that's a little bit of a, a pipe dream with this particular version of the deck but it was still something to consider and i should also note this deck has to play three copies of mystical shine ball which is by far the worst draw in the deck you know we didn't use the word garnet back in the day either but using more modern terminology this deck definitely has three copies of garnet with the three shine balls a couple interesting things to note with shine ball you can special summon them from the hand so that you don't want to draw them, if you absolutely need to, you can use Venus to special summon them from the hand, which is a pretty big deal. Especially because in addition to this package, we also run Birdman. I should also just quickly point out we run Sangin to obviously go along with the tour guides. But we run one copy of Birdman. Birdman's a really interesting card. It is a tuner that can be special summoned to the field by bouncing a face-up monster to your hand. That's useful for a couple different reasons. Number one, just to go with the shine balls, if you have Venus on the field, you can pay... 500 light points and summon one copy of shine ball and then bounce the shine ball to your hand to summon birdman now from here you have two monsters level three one tuner one non-tuner so you can go right here into Brianak, but you can, can continue summoning off of venus for example you could summon that shine ball that you just bounced to your hand you could actually summon another shine ball from the deck heck you could summon all three shine balls from the deck bounce one to the hand and then resummon it off paying 2000 light points to summon four shine balls in one turn and then from there you obviously have tons of flexibility and if you actually can be going for game, you could put the Shine Balls in attack mode. They are 500 attack each. This could be Bryanac. You know, this could be a combination of levels here into a level 5, into a level 7. You can go to Trishula. Having Birdman gives you a ton of flexibility with Venus. It essentially allows you to summon any Synchro Monster from your extra deck. 
minus armory arm, which is a level four, because you can't go three and two into a four, it has to be five. But from there, you have five, you've got eights, you've got sevens, you have all different levels, you go all the way up to nine with Trishula, so tons of flexibility there. You can actually even go into Ally of Justice Decisive Armor, because you have six and then two copies of Mystic Shine Ball. actually get you all the way up to 10, which is a critical card in the mirror match, a card that can completely win the game out of nowhere. So having Birdman in the deck gave you a ton of flexibility. You also can do other things. You know, for example, you can go Tour Guide, search Tour Guide, and you can bounce the Tour Guide that you summoned. So you have a follow-up on the next turn. And now you can actually still synchro with the Tour Guide that you used to initially start that play. You can't synchro with the monster that comes off of Tour Guide, but you can still synchro with the original Tour Guide. So now you have the ability to go into a level six, plus you have a Tour Guide for the following turn, or you could just go into Leviathan or Levier. So there's some cool plays there with Birdman. Plus it's a card that can reset your Chaos Monsters, which is a little bit of a preview of the boss monsters in this deck, but you could summon Black Luster Soldier, banish an opponent's monster, bounce Black Luster Soldier, especially summon Birdman, and now you could use Black Luster Soldier again, whether that's to attack or to banish a second time. Same could be true with Chaos Sorcerer if you happen to run it. So Birdman was a really cool card in this deck. It was also a dark monster, which matters when we're playing Chaos. And the fact that it's level three is really useful because we do have access to Levier and Leviathan on the extra deck. So that is a look at the starters in the terms of the top nine, the three Garnets that we have to play, and then Birdman, which is more of an extender piece. From that point, we'll go next talk about the hand traps. This deck got to play a bunch of hand traps and hand traps that were somewhat unique to this strategy. The first are just Maxi and Effect Failure, which weren't exactly staples per se, but we're certainly becoming close to that when we're talking about the likelihood of playing against the plant deck. Triple Maxi and Triple Effect Failure is definitely more than what the plant deck was able to use. The plant deck typically played four hand traps. A lot of people did three Maxis and one Failure. I remember I typically did two and two splits back in the day, but you could easily just run the three Maxi plus one Effect Failure. Because this particular deck's not going to play any defensive trap cards, it needs to weigh more on the side of hand traps, so it's actually going to go with the full three effect failures and full three maxis. This deck also, because it's not running any defensive cards, got to run Gores, which wasn't exactly a staple because there were trap decks like Gravekeepers that existed, but it was a really popular card in decks that could afford to run it. Plant Synchro, for example, this deck, for example. But in addition to Gores, which was expected, you could definitely surprise people by also running two copies of Tragodia. Trigodia is a fantastic card. One, it's a dark, so it fuels the chaos monsters. Two, the level manipulation matters. The ability to steal opponents' monsters really matters. But this deck, because it's not setting a bunch of cards to the back row, typically has a pretty reasonably sized hand. So it ends up working as a monster that gets special summoned in the battle phase. Opponent might not necessarily expect it. And now all of a sudden you have a 3,000 attack, 3,000 defense Trigodia, and your opponent has to pass the turn. And then you can take full advantage of that. It also gives you more monsters to draw into when you play copies of Max C. Right, in theory, if you're going to take the maxi challenge, if you are aware of gores, you can save an enemy controller, you can save some of your plays, maybe you can save a black luster soldier, you can equip it with an armor, and you can do things to play around the existence of gores. You might get you might get surprised that when your opponent drops Trigodia or having a combination of gores and Trigodia when you anticipated going for game, and now that maxi challenge really backfired on you because you have to pass to them and they have a bunch of cards in hand. So it gives you an additional monster to draw into with maxi. The other hand trap is unique to this deck is Honest. This deck has a ton of light monsters, obviously, but it's also especially good with Earth. I commented on earlier how if you can protect Earth and then summon Venus, now you have a level two tuner and a level three non-tuner plus any quantity of shine balls that you need. If you're not going to play cards like Deep Prison, which this deck's not going to elect to run, Honest does give you that hand trap where you summon Earth, your opponent tries to attack into it. Maybe in a perfect world, you went first and now on turn two or their turn one, they're trying to attack with Thunder King and you go honest, that's fantastic. And obviously if they summon something like Reborn Tengu, it's not as valuable. But if they summon something like Thunder King and try and attack, well, that's fantastic. Now you're getting rid of that. And now you can go into Venus on the following turn and try and take a ton of a card advantage from that play. So honest, a singleton copy. It also combines really well with Black Luster Soldier, a unique win condition for this deck specifically. And then let's talk about the boss monsters, which was another big attraction of this deck. The starters were a big attraction. I think the hand traps were just an okay part. But really, the boss monsters were fantastic. This deck got to play Black Luster Soldier, which other decks got to play, like Plant Deck. But this deck, as you can see, is basically all light or dark, minus Maxi. So it's live even more often than some of the other decks. The next decision point is one that you can decide on your own. So if you look at Barrett Key's deck, he, in Toronto, elected to play Archlord Christia, which was the more common card early on in the format, for sure. The thing with Christia is it's definitely higher impact. And the way Christia works and why it works so well with this deck specifically is 
if you were to summon Venus and summon all three shine balls from your deck, that's automatically four fairies. Obviously, they might not necessarily all be in the grave, especially if you're summoning Gachi Gachi, but you at least have four fairies between the one Venus and the three shine balls. And then even if you don't want to summon the third shine ball and you instead open with Earth, Earth can be the first fairy, Venus can be the second, and then double shine ball into Gachi Gachi can be the third and fourth, which means early on, on turn one, your deck has easy access to four fairies, which is obviously the number that you need for Christia. Christia's higher impact. Christia can just outright win the game if your opponent doesn't have an out to it. As you would see, though, between... Toronto when Barrett first played this deck, and then later on after Wind Up Zen Mains was released and Dino Rabbit was released, you saw he went to Chaos Sorcerer, which I think lines up better against cards like Zen Mains, and I think Chaos Sorcerer is more difficult to deal with from the Dino Rabbit player's perspective. If we're going to play Columbus, which is what I'm pinpointing this deck, I think it makes more sense to play the Christias because that's before the release of Zen Mains and before the release of Dino Rabbit. But I can understand if you'd like to hedge towards consistency. Chaos Sorcerer is the more consistent card. It's way easier to summon. Obviously, your deck is just filled with lights and darks, but it's way lower impact than Archlord Christia. Christia is obviously just the highest impact that you can get out of a monster like this. It can instantly win you the game if your opponent doesn't have an out to it, but it's also a bad top deck late, right? If you weren't able to modulate your graveyard by taking into consideration the number of fairies because you just couldn't afford to do so, obviously on turn eight or nine, it's a really bad top deck. But at the same vein, if you draw it early on, you can absolutely just win the game because of it. So that's a decision that you can make. I wouldn't necessarily recommend running both of these, so I have them both here. But if you're going to go back and play this deck, consider the reality that early on, Christia was more popular. Chaos Sorcerer maybe got more popular towards the end. But you can decide which of the two that you want to go with. And if you want to run more than 40 and play both, you're absolutely entitled to do so. But do not include both of them, at least in the framework of what I'm presenting. And then, of course, we have three Hyperion, the unique boss monster to the Agents. Hyperion was released at a point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history where not everything is once per turn, so you can summon multiple Hyperions, use multiple effects, you can obviously take a ton of advantage from the reality that you have a ton of really great boss monsters. Three Hyperions plus at least three other. Then you could consider cards like Tragodia, I don't want to say boss monsters, but monsters with a lot of attack points, and make it so that you can win the game out of relatively nowhere. But that's our pretty robust monster lineup. We've got our starters, we have our hand traps, including the battle hand traps, we have one extender using modern terminology with Birdman. We have the three Garnets that were required to play. And then we have some quantity of boss monsters. Three up here and a Black Luster Soldier are the absolute necessities. You can decide if you want to play Christia or Sork. That is our monster lineup. Next, we have the spells. We have pretty simple spell lineup. We have three copies of Mystical Space Typhoon and one copy of Heavy Storm. We still do worry about the trap decks, even though Heavy Storm was recently unbanned. You could still run into decks like Heroes. You could still run into TGs, which we just recently profiled. Gravekeepers, other decks as well. So having Triple Mystical Space Typhoon and Heavy Storm is fantastic. The plant deck even runs cards like Solemn Warning. So it's not a bad idea to have MST in your deck. Then we have three cards that were basically staples. Dark Hole, Monster Reborn. Microtrol is not necessarily a staple per se, but it was definitely a power card. This deck, because it has access to a good amount of tuner monsters and Birdman plus Earth, you could definitely use that. This deck also has access to level 3s, so you could steal level 3s to go into Levi Le Levier and Leviathan. It's just a, a power card. It might not have quite as many tuners as other decks, but you can take into consideration something like Effect Bailer too. You probably have plenty to play a card like Mind Control. The last card from a modern context is probably pretty surprising because modern Yu-Gi-Oh! You usually think of a card like Pot of Duality in a pure stun deck or a card like Flunders that doesn't special summon, whereas this deck is going to special summon quite a bit. It has a ton of boss monsters, in addition to that, cards like Venus require you to special summon, but, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh! back in the day took way longer than just one turn. So if you played turn one and just played duality, dug into Earth, summoned it, and then planned on special summoning on turns two, three, and four, that was a pretty reasonable game plan. A lot of plan a lot of players during this time period elected to run Pot of Duality because they felt that you could take a turn off in order to dig into something consistent. Plus, this deck has double Trigodia and Gores, so even if your opponent does happen to open a pretty aggressive hand... Between those three battle hand traps and maxi, chances are you're going to survive. So you would be able to play duality, see what you hit, and eventually get to play it over the next couple turns and not really see the detriment of not being able to special summon. So double duality was actually pretty common in decks during this time period, at least in agent decks specifically. But those are our spells. Trap lineups are actually pretty simple. It is one card. It is Trap Dash Shoot, which is 
Arguably the most powerful trap in the format. If you happen to open it, your likelihood of winning skyrockets. There's a reason this card was banned and is currently banned in Yu-Gi-Oh! But it is our only trap card. This deck doesn't have any of the traditional defensive cards like Torrential Tribute. But Trap Dash, you can literally just win the game on its own. So we are going to include it as our only main deck trap. In terms of the extra deck. So this deck is going to play Armory Arm. Obvious, because we can go into it through the use of one Mystical Shine Ball and then a level two non a level two tuner like Earth. We have Cataster and Librarian for our level fives, which this deck can absolutely go into. We have Bryanac, which is the most powerful level six at the time. For level sevens, which we can absolutely go into, we have Black Rose Dragon, and then a card that this deck got to run that not other not many other decks were able to, which is An Ancient Sacred Wyvern. Wyvern has a really cool effect. It has a similar effect to Colossal Fighter in the sense that when it's destroyed by battle, you can pay a thousand life points to special summon it. Obviously, Colossal Fighter does that for free, but that's what it costs for Ancient Sacred Wyvern. And then when the difference between each player's life points is really significant, meaning you have way more than your opponent, its attack gets boosted. And then technically, if it's the opposite, its attack gets reduced, which isn't great. But either way, it's really difficult to deal with in battle. And if your opponent happens to have very low life points, you can end up summoning an Ancient Sacred Wyvern that has four or five, six thousand attack points and take the game out of nowhere, right? It gives you a one card out to basically any monster in attack position, which can be pretty valuable. And then if you are in a defensive game state and you want to summon this in defense and make it really difficult for your opponent, you can absolutely just do that and keep paying the life points to special summon it and make it a sort of pseudo colossal fighter. So Ancient Sacred Wyvern. What made it unique is the fact that it requires a light tuner monster. And yes, Effect Veiler is legal. Yes, other decks technically ran level sixes that you could combine with Effect Veiler, but it wasn't as common. This deck, because it has Earth, and it actually technically does have Chaos Sorcerer if you like to run it, plus Effect Failure. It had two pathways in order to summon it, so it made it way more practical in this extra deck than any others. In terms of level 8s, we have just basically the best ones, Scrap Dragon and Stardust Dragon. For level 9s, we have Trish, which we can summon a bunch. I talked a little bit about Protecting Earth for a turn, and then I talked a little bit about Birdman. Both are really common ways of going into Trish. This deck can actually play a level 10 Ally of Justice Decisive Armor. This card is a really unique card. The most practical way of summoning this often involves Birdman. If you go Venus plus Birdman, the Venus and the Birdman gives you 6, and then 2 Shine Balls give you 10. Decisive Armor is a level 10 that requires a tuner and 2 non-tuners, 2 or more non-tuners. And the reason why you would play this card is in the Mirror Match, its third effect allows you to send your hand to the graveyard, which is obviously an insane cost. But then you look at your opponent's hand and send all light monsters in their hand to the graveyard and then inflict damage to your opponent equal to the combined attack of all of those light monsters. Well, in this particular deck, obviously there are a ton of boss monsters between Hyperion, Archlord Christia, even Black Luster Soldier. You could actually just win the game out of nowhere by summoning Ally of Justice Decisive Armor and sending your hand to the graveyard and then just inflicting a ton of damage to your opponent. So really cool card and you could manipulate it where you set your hand Granted, this deck's primarily monsters, but you could summon this, summon all your boss monsters, and then use this card's effect. It's not like you have to send five cards. You can send however many cards in your hand to the graveyard, and then look at your opponent's hand and do that effect. So Decisive Armor plus Special Summoning a bunch of boss monsters basically always meant you won. It also, for something worth note, it gave you a look at whether or not they had Tragodia and Gores, which is also something that can be pretty valuable. In addition to that, it let you take the maxi challenge. Now, granted, effect failure is a real card, so that might be a little bit unreasonable to think of that, but, you know, if your opponent has more cards in hand, there's a better chance that Decisive Armor goes through. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but it is definitely something that could come up. Then we have Exceed Monster. So we have Gachi Gachi, which is really the unique card that this deck got to run. Not many other decks have the ability to go into level twos. With Shine Ball through Venus, obviously you get instant level twos on the field. We are going to play two copies because... The first copy is usually easy to summon. You can technically go into the second copy, though, because Earth is a level 2, and then Earth plus the last Shine Ball can technically still go into a second Gachi Gachi. You know, you can imagine later in the game, your opponent deals with the first Gachi Gachi, the first Venus, and then you summon Earth, search Venus. They can't deal with the Earth. Let's just say they're out of monsters. And then you summon Venus on the next turn, and you decide to summon the Shine Ball out of your deck, the third one, and then go into Gachi Gachi there. Maybe you prefer going into a Synchro, but at least you have the flexibility. Then we have Levier and Leviathan Dragon, which are really the best two rank threes that we have at the time. They combine, at least specifically, Levier really well with Chaos Sorcerer, Black Luster Soldier, Hyperion. I should point out, right, for those of you who are aware of the time period, there was a very small window of time where you could detach Saiyan off of Leviathan Dragon and search. It was considered on the field, which is just absolutely insane. 
Leviathan Dragon in this deck with that ability made this deck absolutely ridiculous because you could go Tor Guy, Get Sang, and Detach, Search, Effect Veiler, and now you have a Light and a Dark already. It was one of the main reasons why this deck was so powerful because it could jam all the Chaos Monsters, and then one Tor Guide was instantly a Light, Dark, plus a 2500, so... Thankfully, that ruling was changed, or else it would have some pretty massive ramifications, not only on this format, but in Yu-Gi-Oh! as a whole. But just a, something to point out, these two cards still fantastic, but they were even more ridiculous for a small window of time in the testing leading up to Toronto. And then the last card is Utopia. I have elected not to put Thunder King Rai on my extra deck, or my side deck, rather, which makes Utopia more difficult than normal for this deck to summon, so I could see you cutting Utopia. But if you have Thunder King somewhere within your main and side deck, which this deck did typically do, at least on the side deck. It is useful to have this because you play Mind Control, and that actually gives you an out to your opponent's Thunder King. But one copy of Utopia, which was probably the best rank four. Technically, Steel Shroom Roach was out, but Utopia was the more universally applicable one. Moving on to the side deck, we have, in terms of top decks at the time, or decks that you can anticipate playing against, we have Heroes, we have Gravekeepers, which still existed. If you're playing with Columbus, you're playing with Dark World. My side deck is built to combat Dark World, so that's where I'm pinpointing this. If you play Toronto, Dark World's not out yet, and you have to adjust the side deck. Obviously, you have Plants, what the deck is, or what the format's typically known for. We have Karakuri, which was reasonably popular. We have TG decks, whether it was Stun decks with Barbaros, whether it was more Beatdown decks. Technically, Dark Souls' last event where it got to search multiple times during the end phase was Columbus, so I know players like Sam Pedigo that played X-Sabers for that. It was still a pretty reasonable deck. And then, of course, the Mirror Match. Not the people who played Jupiter, but the Mirror Match. So how are we combating this? So in terms of the anti-Dark World, I remember oversiding for Dark World at Columbus in my plant deck, and I never played against it, but I was really afraid of it. So if I were to go back, I could totally see allotting cards like Gemini Imps and Shadow Imprisoning Mirror just because they are total blowouts against the Dark World matchup. Shadow Imprisoning Mirror is really the best, but they expect that and can side things like MST. It's really difficult to deal with Gemini Imps. Basically what this lets you do is when your opponent plays card destruction or Dark World dealings, you just discard Gemini Imps, negate that, and then draw a card. So it basically makes your opponent fizzle their effect and then you get to replace the Gemini Imps. Gives you just an insane card to combat what they're trying to do. So this is my anti-Dark World package. My anti-Karakuri package that also did really well against some of the other decks. You know, Cyber Dragon's always been a good card against monsters that have high attack. Like Alias, it's actually pretty good against Gravekeepers because if they don't have Necro Valley, you can attack over Spy. And even if they do, you can attack over all of the monsters like Descendant and at least Crash with Commandant. And then in terms of other beatdown decks like TGs, it's a pretty good card. So Cyber Dragon has utility not just in the Karakuri matchup where you can go into Chimera Tech Fortress Dragon with all of their Synchro Monsters, but it's also just a generically good card against Beatdown decks which existed at the time. Gladiator Beast 2, although I don't have it pictured here, is a deck that this, this card did really well against, so that package. I could see you cut Utopia for Chimera Tech and then just put another card in the side deck, maybe even a third Cyber Dragon. I think that's totally reasonable. I don't know how much utility Utopia is going to have. I, I know this is a level 4, but if I don't play Thunder King, it's not as likely to actually go into it. For the mirror match, we have two copies of Leeching the Light. This card was absolutely insane. Leeching the Light allowed you to basically boost all of your monsters by the attack of one of your opponent's light monsters. This card was only good in decks that could summon a lot of monsters. Typically in the plant deck, it worked really well with scapegoats. What this deck can do, though, is it can summon Venus, and then it can summon all three of the Shine Balls out, and now you can play Leeching the Light. Let's say your opponent has their own copy of Venus on the field, and now all of your monsters are boosted by the attack of Venus, in addition to the three Shine Balls, now all of a sudden you just have a ton of attack points. In this particular matchup, you could very easily win the game through Leeching the Light. And if your deck had the ability to span the field, which this deck could do, it was really a flexible card that just won the game out of nowhere, really. It gave you a game plan against the Light decks. Then we have a package for the Beatdown decks, the Stun decks, the Trap decks during the time. It's good to have some resistance to Thunder King Ryo. This particular deck can be a little bit weak to Thunder King Ryo. You have outs to it, but summoning Tour Guide and having it get negated when you go into Leviathan doesn't feel great all the time. Feels like you're kind of just, you know, foregoing your normal summon and then using a basically a pseudo smashing ground effect. If you have to go into Venus, it feels a little bit better because they're forced to negate the gotcha gotcha and then you still have Venus. That's a little bit different. 
So you do have some resistance to Thunder King, but Thunder King could be a difficult card if you're playing cards like Earth and you're playing cards like Duality. So having cards to stop that, especially in decks that are more devoted to the stun strategy, having Bottomless and Deep Prison just gave you some resistance against heroes, against TGs, against those strategies. These cards are also pretty good against Dark Worlds to a certain extent. One thing, if you are actually going to go back and play this, when it comes to these cards, you typically want to see your opponent put Graffa in the graveyard first and then try to set one of these because otherwise it's a pretty reasonable likelihood that they're just going to discard Graffa and pop these and then these are absolutely just horrible. So if you're going to put these in the deck against Graffa, yes, inherently they seem like they're good because they banish Graffa and that's useful for the long run, but you actually want to hold Deep Prison until it's clear that the opponent has Graffa in the grave and then you can more reliably set this once Graff is already on the field, and then banish it. So that's something to consider. One copy of Dust Tornado is just super flexible. It was good against Gravekeepers. It was good against Dark World when you're trying to combat the field spell. Good against skill, skill drain cards like that. I figured if I'm playing a Singleton card, I think a card like Dust Tornado is a pretty reasonable 15th card. But that is the side deck. One last final thing before I end the video, just because I never pointed this out, and I think it's kind of an interesting thing to go back and talk about when we think about this format, which is... When do you max C Venus? This was a discussion point that a lot of players had back in the day. I remember having this discussion with a lot of people driving up to Toronto, the first event of this format. My car had Jesse Samick, Joe Bogley, and Paul Clark in it, so it's a pretty awesome group of people. We all played plants, and we had this discussion, and a lot of players during this time period had this discussion. And I think, I think the decision that we that we made in retrospect was probably correct, but it's something that's worth thinking about. So if you have any other thoughts about this, feel free to comment in the section below, the comments below, and we'll see if maybe modern Yu-Gi-Oh has changed your thoughts on this. So the question here is, your opponent summons Venus, they're going first, right? You have Max C in your hand, they pay the 500, do you Max C? That might seem like an odd question because yes, you're going to play Max C on the turn, but the question is, when do you do it? If you play Max C immediately, what happens? Well, they summon Shine Ball, you draw one card, and then they pass. That could be good, it depends on the rest of your hand. But there's also a universe though where you actually let them summon the first Shine Ball, and then they pay 500 here, and then they summon a second Shine Ball, and you max see the activation of the second. So they go pay 500, you go chain, this resolves, this comes out, and now you draw one card. Well, at this point, your opponent feels more priced into summoning Gachi Gachi than they would before. There's no way they're going to go second Shine Ball into Gachi Gachi and let you draw three cards off Maxi. That's pretty difficult to really to really accept from the player's perspective, so they're just not going to do that. They'll pass like this and just accept that they got hit by Maxi. But if they pay the 500 and they end like this, do you think they're willing to go into Gachi Gachi? And if you can deal with Gachi Gachi, you know, originally when the decision made, was made to Maxi or not Maxi, if you could actually reasonably deal with Gachi Gachi, I think the correct thing would be to Maxi the second activation, because at this point, they'd be more priced into going into Gachi Gachi, and then obviously you'd end up getting a pot of greed effect, basically. You'd get two cards off of your... Max C. Now, if you couldn't deal with Gachi Gachi, that totally changes the scenario. But one of the things that we talked about that was a little counterintuitive was when do you Max C against agents? And actually considering the possibility of getting the second card if they go into a Gachi Gachi that you actually can deal with. But just something to consider if you go back and play this format. Yes, you're going to play Max C against Venus, but it might not necessarily always be just hitting it immediately. If you look at the makeup of your hand and you say, wow, no, actually, I can deal with Gachi Gachi. I actually don't mind this at all. Well, then consider holding it for the second one. That way they're priced into the Gachi Gachi and you end up getting a pot of greed effect off of the Maxi instead of just a one for one. But nevertheless, that's Joji Orlando for Yu-Gi-Oh! History. Thank you for watching. Check back soon for plenty more Yu-Gi-Oh! content. Thank you.